Alright, welcome back to the Atlanta Child Murders Revisited. This is um, video number 142. We're going to go back into the Atlanta Monster and just knock out as much as we can here. But I'm going to make comments along the ways and point out connections. And, I mean, you, you can go listen to this, all this on your own time, okay, if you want. If you don't want to listen to me, that's fine. But you're not going to get my commentary, and you're not going to get my connections. So I've read over everything that's out there, watched all the videos, and I put it together, my friends. And as we go along, I point out the connections and other information that they don't present here. Like I said, Payne Lindsay, he does a good production job, but highly naive, especially in the beginning. Eventually, I think he comes around, he gets it, but, you know, he'll tell you that he's playing this game, but you can tell that he's being coy, but you can tell he's kind of, you know, just going along with whatever the latest information that he has. And not using his cognitive reasoning skills, I guess you could say. But um, anyway, he's a young guy. He hadn't been around, so we'll give him that. All right, here you go. These kids were black. Popcorn and McComas both mentioned FBI profilers. The people who formulate an idea of who the killer is, who the FBI should be looking for. There was one characteristic that stood out to me immediately. It had to be a black guy. A white man could not go into a black neighborhood, pick up a kid, put him in his car, and drive off without anybody seeing him. Absolutely. If there was a crime scene, then the media was just unbelievable. And with all of the attention this case was getting, it was almost impossible to get into a predominantly black neighborhood not be challenged or approached or whatever if you were white. It just doesn't happen. In fact, when we went into black neighborhoods during the investigation, everybody on the street was out on their front porch as soon as we appeared in the neighborhood. There was one place that I think is gone now. It was a housing project. They had what they call the Bat Patrol. And these were adults that walked around with baseball bats and looking for suspicious characters or protecting the community. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to make a formal checklist on this, but just right off, you know, logic in the top of my head, you know, first of all, there's... All right, so before we get back into the video, this section they were talking about just reminded me of things I've been talking about, and I finally just decided to make a list of it, okay? And so you're going to hear McCormick say, we couldn't figure out how he was getting him in the car. They figured out it had to be a black guy, but they couldn't figure out how the guy is getting him in the car, okay? And this is why um, they put down those statements from their interview in Wayne when he talks about how he does uh, trying to put together a group of kids, he puts out flyers, stuff like that, and then that set off alarm bells because that's how they, that's, you know, you put your brain together and then, you know, these questions right here that I have, you have to answer them. Why is he doing it? How's he selecting the victim? How's he locating them? How's he getting them in the car? Okay. How's he approaching them without them running off? How's he getting them to stay in the car and not bolt? Um, why is he killing them? All these things. And when he started talking about Nova Entertainment and this audition for the New Jackson 5, that set off alarm bells for the FBI. And they're like, ah, that answers those questions. Because in their back of their mind, there's all these questions right here that I have. So I've haven't put them in the form of questions, just put them in statements. So we'll just start off at the beginning because all this is kind of a summary of what I've been saying and what everyone else is saying. 
You'll hear them say it in different ways, but everyone is thinking the same thing. In the media, in the mayor's office, in the police department, in the, uh, you know, these community groups are trying to figure out, you know, do we give them whistles? Um, they're teaching kids how to, you know, resist, you know, with karate, um, ligature strangulation, how to get away from that, all these different things. Um, but in the combination of all this, you know, this is what's happening. These are the questions that are coming up. So, first of all, the selection of the victim. Is it random? Is he just driving by and picking up some kid? No. Why, you know, he's putting out these flyers, but why is he doing what he's doing? Is he angry at himself? Is he angry at the community? Is it anger uh, towards something that happened to him? Is he just some opportunist that's killing kids for snuff films? Um, is he killing these kids because they're threatening to tell? I'm going to tell my mom, I'm going to tell the police what you've been doing to me and these other kids. Oh, really? Okay. Um, are there other things? Is it Wayne Williams is into the horoscope thing with his Gemini? Maybe it's some kind of, I don't know, astrological dating or something like that. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't believe that kind of crap. But just because I don't believe something doesn't mean someone else doesn't believe it and follow it, you know? Um, or is it just random, you know? And then how is he locating the victims? Well, we know he's putting out flyers, okay? He's putting out radio ads. Again, how is he affording that? Uh, he has no money, no job. His parents are bankrupt. He's doing these auditions. Once they call in, he's selectively selecting mostly boys, young boys. He's probably asking them their age on the phone. He's doing these auditions because I believe that he's screening them for his portfolio. For his snuff films or for his you know, his fly-in clients or his local uh, clients that he's pimping them out. Possibly. I don't know. Um... And then, of course, once he does the audition, he's got their name, he's got a photograph, he's got their age, he's got their address, he's got their phone number. He's probably asking them where they hang out, you know, the boys' club, the game room at the Omni, all these kinds of things. That's where he knows how to get them later. Because you don't want to have them come to the audition with the parents or come to the audition and they've told the parents and then the kid ends up dead, you know, my kid went to this audition at the studio in Buckhead with this Wayne Williams, and now he ended up dead. Oh, mine did too. So he has to do, has to do. Once he's made contact, he has to make some kind of separate contact that's not connected to Nova Entertainment or anything that's going to come back to him. Okay. Um, let's see. Now, once he's done the audition, and they've gone their merry way, because like I said, we see. That the F, that Larry Peterson, once a kid is killed, he's gone to the home and looked through the the clothing in the in the hamper and found out that some of them had fibers from Wayne Williams' house, but he doesn't know it's Wayne Williams' house. He just checks the clothes that they wore before they got killed, and then came home and took off and put on new clothes, and he finds these same fibers. But he doesn't know it's from Wayne Williams' house. Okay? He just knows it's probably the same place or murderer's crime scene. But he doesn't know where that's at. Okay? So, how you know, how's he making contact? Um, there's some kids that got phone calls. Okay? They got phone calls and then they, they got on their bike or they ran out the door. Okay? Um, there were other kids that were just hanging out. Other kids that were hiding at the game room at the Omni. Okay? I'm trying to think of other different situations. Um, 
Yeah, we'll have to go back and I think that's one of the most important things is where were the, like, you know, Alfred Evans was at the theater there on Peachtree Street. That's an area where Wayne Williams is hanging out. Uh, this other kid was with his girlfriend and they went to the skating, the first victim, they went to the skating rink at Greenbrier and then supposedly went to a party. But what happened to the girlfriend? When did she separate from them? Okay, so there's something there that you need to really need. They really need to dig into the stories about the last person to see them and when the last place and time they were seen. Okay, like uh, Darren Glass got off a bus at that intersection of Second and what Glenwood and Memorial, and then another person saw. A guy fitting Wayne Williams' description with a blue car and grabbed a kid, took him out in the woods here to with a gun. He heard a shot, brought the kid back, and he was limp, you know, limped over and threw him in the trunk. So there's lots of different things that are going on there. But how's he, con- you know, how's he contacting them? How does he know they're going to be where they're at and not with other people? Okay, like Aaron White. They saw Aaron White over at the um, at the store over there. Okay? So a lot of them, like I said, I think it's just Wayne Williams. He's got a list of victims. And he's going from one place, one address, one place they're hanging out to the next. Okay? I mean, like Aaron White was at some store. He wasn't over in Thomasville Heights. Okay? Patrick Rogers is at the bus stop. He wasn't at his house. Okay. Lee Terrell was at a convenience store up the street from his house. So how did he... How does Wayne Williams know to go to these areas to pick these kids up? He, I, I think he's just roaming these areas. And when he sees a kid that he recognizes in these areas that's when he stops and approaches them okay and so so what if he does see them you know a lot of these kids you know let's see like um lee terrell he got thrown out of the the swimming pool he went to the convenience store and he should have gone home his mom would have expected him home and did expect him home so how does Wayne Williams get him in the car and, and the guy said, no, no, I, I, I'd like to go to the audition, another with you, and I'd like to make 20 bucks, but I, I promised my mom I'd be home. Oh, no, well, come on, I'll give you a ride. You know, I can see these all these different scenarios. You know, Luby Getter. You know, we have an actual witness to one of these enticements because that's what it is. It's an enticement. How do you get him in the car? Once you've found them now, now you've found them. How do you get him in the car? Okay. So. It's like a mousetrap. You can build the greatest mousetrap in the world. But if you can't get the damn mouse to go in your trap. And the gate closed. Boom. It's a useless mousetrap. Okay. So what is the enticement? Is it. Hey. You know. I'm just making up stuff here so hey uh, Lee you know we we did this audition we want to get you back in for another audition um, for some recording so we can sign that contract okay well my mom expected me at home and I can't really go right now but hey I'll give you 20 bucks you know here get in the car we'll go tell your mom where we're going we're going to the studio we'll run by tell your mom and then we'll go to the studio okay so he's deceived them to get them in the car. Okay. Or he's, you know, hey, I'll get you an ice cream. Or, hey, you know, your shoes look kind of worn out. I can probably buy you some new shoes, too. Okay. And he's groomed them. He's taken them after audition. He's taken them for ice cream. Or because the owner of the studio said that he would give some of the kids rides home sometime. So he's grooming them. He's taken them. They're window shopping. Hey, look at those nice shoes there. Well, 
you know, if you do this or do that, I can probably get you some, some shoes here. And so he's groomed them along the way into doing sexual favors or whatever, whatever the extent of what he's doing, okay? So that's the deception. He's got him in the car now. So let's just say, for instance, Lee Terrell. He's got Lee Terrell in the car. He starts driving, and then Lee Terrell looks out the window and notices, hey, we're not going to my house. Where, where are we going? Oh, I got to go by this store real quick and get something. No, I got I to gotta get home right now. My mom, she's expecting me. I'm going to be in real big trouble. So that's a problem right there. Okay? Because if he acts all aggressive and says, you're going to stay right here in this damn car, the kid's going to get, ah, depending on how big the kid is, and he's going to bolt. So you got to have some way of keeping them in the car because if it's just him, you know, like with Aaron White, there was two people. With Mathis, there was two people in the car. Okay? So that right there, one person can hold them, but still... If the person sitting in the back seat, trying to hold on to someone in the front seat, around the seats, that could be a problem also. So, he's either, hey, uh, you want some beer? Or, hey, you want a cola? He's already got it laced with drugs. And they do that, and then, boom, they're out. Or, he's got chloroform because this other kid said that before he got out of the car... Wayne Williams put this cloth in front of his face and it smelled funny and he was able to get away. So that could be a problem right there too. One thing they don't talk about is I wonder if the doorknob, if he's removed the doorknob, you know, and says it's broken on the passenger side, okay, or maybe remove Maybe he's got these automatic locks, and then he's removed the uh, the lock part. You know, the little tab that would stick out so the kid can't lift that and open the door and get out. Or maybe he's fixed the door, or once it's shut, he can't get it open again. But that's going to be hard to do because he can't get the door open in the first place. I'm sure there's some way he's done something to keep them in the car because once... Once they start heading back to the highway or to his place, the jig's up. The prey starts to realize, just like that rat in the cage, okay? And I hate comparing these victims to rats, but I'm just saying, he's, if you don't shut that gate, you know, like in that movie, the lying in the, the, the darkness with the lions. If you don't shut that gate, that lion's going to bolt and get out of there. It's the same thing with these kids. The kids are going to figure it out, and they're going to bolt at the first intersection, which is what I think happened with Aaron White. Because right there, right above where he's at, there's a big intersection just a few feet away. So I think what happened is they picked him up once he realized he wasn't going home, that something's not right. He bolted. They chased him. He didn't realize that the bridge, okay, below wasn't wasn't just dirt on the other side of that railing. Like it was just right down, you know, where the road's at. He didn't realize, because it was dark, he didn't realize that it fell to the uh, train track. And so they tried to get him. He climbed up on that railing and then fell. He thought he was just going to hit the dirt on the other side, but he, he ended up smacking his head on the, um, the railroad trestle. And so they drive down, and they double-check to make sure he's dead. But that's a great risk there. Someone can see that, you know. But, I don't know. And then, so there's some suppression that didn't work, like, with Luby Getter, he's in that car in Wayne Williams' lap while Nathaniel Cater is driving, and they're at that cemetery, and that woman and her husband see them struggling, 
Wayne Williams is struggling with the kid, struggling to keep his wig on. And see what that tells you is that Wayne Williams is using different disguises. He's got his glasses on. He's got his glasses off. He's got a wig on. He's got a wig off. He's got his hat, baseball hat on. He's got his baseball hat off. He's got different color baseball hats, different color jackets. Okay. He's got different people in the car with him. He's got different vehicles that he's using. Okay. So he may pick up a victim in one vehicle and deposit the body in another vehicle. Okay. That's just standard, you know, that's just standard situation of stuff you're going to do. You're going to change up your look. You're going to change up your vehicle. You're going to change up your dress. So, and then the killing of the victim. Is it all force to get them there? Or is he enticing them with money to come do what they think is going to be another nude film or nude photo shoot and it turns into a snuff film or just he's just killing them out of anger? Something's going on there, okay? And I don't mean to be gross, but with the ligature strangulation, he's definitely behind them, okay? And since they don't have their clothes on, it's probably some kind of anal sex or something like that that's going on. And then when they're not, and he's filming it, maybe Nathaniel Cater, James Comento, Jimmy Jen, you know, Jimmy Ray Payne are filming it, who, you know, or even Homer Simpson is Homer Simpson. Even Homer Williams is filming it. Who knows? And I don't mean to be gross, but we have, you know, we're all adults. This is what happens. These things are happening. These things happen. And, you know, this is probably what's going on there. Okay. Now, I'm not saying these kids deserved it or they're asking for it, but up to 10 of them were already going over there for money at Uncle Tom Terrell's house and having sex with, with random gay men that would come in. So it's not that much of a stretch to think they would be doing stuff for money. Not all of them, just some of them for money and you know including nude photos videos they don't know they're going to be doing a snuff film so he's got them from behind and then he's brought out his ligature strangulation cable or whatever that is and he puts it around their neck really quick and boom it's all over okay and then the part of the disposing of the victim well, he's putting him out in woods, but not too far because he's not going to go dragging a body at 3 in the morning in the darkness. Old fat, chubby Wayne Williams tripping on kudzu out there. He's no more than 20 feet off the road, okay? Or later he's dumping them in the rivers. And then when he finds out about the fibers, he's and he's either removing the clothing and dumping the rivers or removing the clothing and dumping them in the woods... And then he's separately disposing of the clothing. Okay. So that's kind of the scenario there that we're looking at. This is, I have absolutely no factual evidence, documents, or any of this. I'm just, you know, we're sitting around the table talking about it. If you're FBI or police or whatever, and they're saying, well, how is he, why is he doing this? Okay, matter of fact, I forgot to put that in there. Why is he, I'll put the killer doing this. And I've gone over scenarios, you know, um, maybe he was molested as a child. Maybe it could have just been as simple as Wayne William. you know, Homer Williams beat him too much. And brought out a lot of anger that he didn't have any way of expressing. So this is his expression of that. Um, I go for the someone in the community molested him when he was a child. And then now he's older. Now he has the power. He is not the victim anymore. He is in control. Because when you listen to Wayne Williams, that's all you hear about him being in control. Okay, and that's what happens people that are victims okay if they don't get professional help 
they will become they will become uh, abusers. People that are abused will become abusers. That's how the cycle continues, okay? Unless they get some kind of professional help. So I, th I think that's probably what we're dealing with here, okay? Now, he'll never admit that because he'll never want to be from a position of weakness. This is why he gets angry about people calling him a homosexual, okay? Because in the society of that time, a homosexual is a limp wrist, kind of high, you know, a weak person, okay? And, you know, not in control. They're, they're, get, they're on the receiving end, okay? And Wayne Williams is definitely never going to be on the receiving end anymore. He's going to be on the, the action end, the giving end, if you know what I mean, okay? So that's a position of dominance and control, okay? That's where he wants to be because inside of him is that child that got abused, okay? And he doesn't want to be that child anymore. He wants to be in control, and this is his way, a sick way, of being in control is by killing other children. He can't go back and kill the people who abused him, so now he's going to kill their children, okay? That's how he's getting back at this society because he's killing their children instead of killing them the people that abused him he's killing their children and making them suffer we're all you know half a million million two million of us all living in terror 24 hours a day every time you walk out that door you don't know who that car approaching you is. it could be the killer you know I had I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I had nightmares. I had anxiety. When people would drive by as I'm walking home, because I stayed late for chorus practice or, or some play, and having to walk that mile or two home, you know, 30, 45 minutes, there was a lot of anxiety. Every, you know, every time you heard the tires, you know, going across the gravel, slowing down behind you, you instantly turned around and looked and got ready to bolt. So that was his power, okay? The terror was his power. He in, inflicted all kinds of terror, just like Charles Manson did on the white community in Los Angeles, the rich white people that rejected him, okay, and sent him to jail. He turned their kids against them. This is what Wayne Williams is doing some segment of the black community okay abused him and misused him and this is his way of getting back by killing their children and by terrorizing them that they'll never know who it is they'll never be able to find him and he's standing right beside them he's at their funeral taking photos he's standing by the police listening to the latest news about it he's standing next to the news reporter as they're talking to a, a family member this is his way of compensating for what happened to him it's revenge for his childhood trauma that's what I think that's why he's doing it I'm no psychologist but it doesn't take a rocket scientist or a psychologist with a PhD to figure out the basics of human anger. If someone has done something wrong to you, we're all human, we all want some form of revenge or compensation. Okay? Whether it's just the person to say, I'm sorry, or... You get some kind of financial compensation or they go to jail or in some other countries they beat him with a cane. You know, something. They all want everybody. If you've been, you've been wrong, all of us, we've all been schnookered and wronged and taken advantage of and abused. 
okay we've all it's all happened to all of us we've all had a moment of weakness and we got taken okay and maybe in the back of your mind even today you think of god if i could ever see that guy i'm just gonna knock that motherfucker out i do it i think it you know after time those you get so busy that you just don't have time for revenge okay or you got family responsibilities and mortgage and and rent and bills and you can't people are depending on you, you can't go you know taking revenge you know like that story that about revenge when you go seeking revenge you got to dig two graves one for the person that you're killing and one for yourself but this is Wayne Williams revenge okay it, it sounds pretty bleak and sounds pretty you know simplistic but I think that's exactly what we're dealing with is Wayne Williams was abused by someone in the community someone he thinks that's a prominent member of the community maybe multiple people in the community and no one ever did anything to stop it or save him or help him or change him in a different direction they all rejected him made fun of him made his pudgy little Wayne Williams he's got you know coke bottle glasses and he can't play sports and he can't play dodgeball and you know all he does is read his damn books all day poor little Wayne Williams you know that's what I think it is it's just you know how many times have we seen the bully you know knock down the nerd the book nerd with the glasses and take the girl and kick sand in his face you know remember those ads that Mr. Atlas ads they used to have in the comic books they put those there for a reason because the kids reading the comic books were wishing they were had superpowers and they got the girl and they could beat the bad guy okay and I remember my mom she she was kind of making fun of me reading that article I said look I'm gonna order this Mr. Atlas you know muscle program and then my mom would say hey you can write to Mr. Atlas and say hey I sent my 1995 and I've been waiting six months for you to send me my muscles and they still haven't arrived what's the hell's going on my mom was making fun of me about that but I'm rambling but I think that's exactly what we're, it's just that fucking simple he wasn't in control as a child he got abused as a child when he looked around there was nobody there to for him to talk to I mean can you imagine trying to talk to Homer Sim Homer Simpson Homer Williams it doesn't seem like you know hey buddy let's have a chat okay you know what you let them touch you what the hell's wrong with you you know, well, I'll deal with this, but I'm going to beat your ass. You shouldn't have been hanging out with that guy. I told you to stay away from him. They would blame Wayne, okay? He probably, that's probably what happened too. But Dad, I didn't know, you know. Uh, you know. So, somebody in the community, some prominent person, a policeman, a news figure, a minister, abused Wayne Williams maybe several people and this was his way of getting back at them because he couldn't expose them he couldn't come out and shame them maybe they're already dead but the children were still around the grandchildren were still around and so this is his revenge it's just that fucking simple folks I really believe that's what it is no one was there for Wayne Williams to stop the abuse to listen to him I feel sorry for him in a sense okay because we've all been there we've all had been taken advantage of we've all been taken to the cleaners we've all been schnookered okay and we all wanted revenge but you know most of us didn't go and kill the children of the people that schnookered us okay or kill the person who who schnookered us some do you know but I think that's essentially why the killer is doing this 
and then I have this list here of how he's doing it. Maybe he did start off really trying to get the Gemini group going, and that didn't work out. Or maybe James Comento or Jimmy Jen found out what he was doing and offered him, there's another way you can make some money. Okay? It'll help you make money. These kids will be making money. Everybody be happy. Okay? Besides, some of these kids are already going over there to Tom Terrell's house, and, you know, people are paying them $10 for each trick to eat whatever, you know, already. So what's the big deal, right? Just give them $20. That's why I'm, that's why I'm thinking that's what happened. Again, you got to think, and, and the reason I go into the child pornography thing is because, again, he's putting out all these flyers, he's running up all that gas, driving all those different cars, renting all those different cars, paying for all the studio time, paying for the radio ads. Where the hell is he getting the money? He hadn't put a group together. It's over $500 a month at least. You got to eat. You got to put gas in the car. You got to give these kids money to go do whatever they're going to do. Where's he getting this money? He obviously has to be making money somehow because it all can't be Homer Simpson. Homer Simpson, God Almighty. Homer Williams forking out all this money because after a while, you know, it's four years, folks. Twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars at least, probably close to fifty thousand dollars. Okay, while his mother is dying of cancer, you know, Homer Williams seems like a cruel son of a bitch bastard, but I very much doubt that given, you know, $100, he'd say, here, go audition some more kids so you, you can be a, continue to be a loser, not put out that album, not sign that contract not make the next Jackson 5 instead of putting $100 to his own wife who's sleeping in the same bed with to her cancer treatment and she's coughing up blood and sick and throwing up and all that kind of shit. So he ain't getting that money from Homer Williams, I guarantee you. He's making that money somehow. And how's he making it? I mean... You tell me. They're printing up flyers, putting out radio spots. Radio spots aren't cheap. Okay? Probably paying the phone bill. Putting gas in the car. He's driving all over the place. Renting cars. Renting audition studio time. He's buying these kids clothes. Buying them ice cream. I stood right there in front of me, bought an ice cream. He's wearing nice clothes. He's, he's paying these kids. He's got to be getting money somehow. And there's no way in hell when his mom is dying of cancer that Homer Williams is going to be putting out $500, $1,000 a month and then have to go home and sleep in the same bed while his wife's coughing up blood and throwing up, dying of cancer. There just ain't no fucking way. Okay? I'm just being honest, folks. You know? Oh, well, here, like I said, here's $100 so you can keep being a loser and never put together that Jackson 5. And meanwhile, your mom's dying because, you know, of cancer because we don't have any money for that. Doesn't make any sense. So he's making money somehow. I, I'm proposing because... All these things are Jimmy Jen and Michael Thevis, and it's related to the porn industry. And piggybacking along with that is the child pornography. So it's got to be how it's happening. That's why I see. I mean, just think about it logically. There it is. All right, so we're going to go back to this. I have rambled way too long here. All right. 
the next eight weeks, Blue Apron is teaming up with Whole30. Their menu will feature two Whole30 approved recipes each week, like Mexican Spice Bear Munch with avocado and kale and sweet potato salad. Blue Apron delivers fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and step-by-step -step recipes that can all be cooked in under 45 minutes. And it's all designed by Blue Apron's in-house culinary team. And right now, Blue Apron is treating Atlanta Monster listeners to their first three meals, a $30 value, with your first order if you visit blueapron.com slash Atlanta. So check out this week's menu and get $30 off with free shipping at blueapron.com slash Atlanta. Again, and again, the reason why I don't skip over these ads is because, you know, as much as I don't like this whole Atlanta Monster stuff, I've learned stuff from it. Maybe you're learning something from it. I've got a lot of names from this. So Payne Lindsay has done the work just naively, and they deserve to be compensated for the money and the work they put into this. And the way they do that is by the advertisements. So that's why I let them run, not skipping ahead of them, letting them run so they get credit for that. So go shop at Blue Apron and help them out. That's blueapron.com slash Atlanta. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. What we have is raw news footage from WSB TV. Um, we have 17,000 hours of raw news footage. So far, I've identified 614 clips, but we have about another 150 tapes to scrub through. Um, the whole time I've been working on this collection, I've been thinking, someone, some, someday, someone is going to come along and do this. It was you guys. It was you guys. Step aboard our TARDIS. It's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Where are we going? Down to the sub-basement. High-density storage vault. It's like a roller coaster. Oh, so when we watch those videos and it says, like, UGA something archives, that's what we're watching. So, um, Hezekiah and this other guy have has gone through and put a lot of those from those archives. Yes, I can make it go fast if you'd like. Make it go fast. It's a 30,000 square foot facility which we keep at 50 degrees Fahrenheit with a relative humidity of 30 percent. 32 feet from floor to the ceiling. Actually the top of our ceiling there is the floor of the second floor. Prior to us building this building here, it was a, um, a Native American settlement of some sort here, if, if I understand what people have told me over the years. Everything is shelved down here by size and then by barcodes. How many records do you think you guys have on the Atlanta child murders? In Atlanta, another body was discovered today, the 23rd. At police task force headquarters, there are 27 faces on the wall, 26 murdered, one missing. We do not know the person or persons that are responsible, therefore we do not have the motive. From Tenderfoot TV and How Stuff Works in Atlanta. Like 11 other recent victims in Atlanta, Rogers apparently was asphyxiated. Atlanta is unlikely to catch the killer unless he keeps on killing. This is Atlanta Monster. Sketching back then wasn't what it is today. I mean, some of these sketches they come out with are better than photographs. Back then, you know, you worked with what you had, and it was a pretty good sketch. We had a composite of it, of who this guy would be. What did it look like, do you remember? Well, it was a black male with bushy hair. I remember the composite sketch very well. This is a folder of paperwork I kept from um, my time as administrator coordinator of the Atlanta child murder cases. It was an animosity between uh, the local police and the FBI. And one of the main things was the mayor, Maynard Jackson. He says, I want every living FBI agent. My police department is basically incompetent and they can't solve it. We need the FBI to solve it. So he threw his department under the bus. None of us want to get involved because it looked like a, a, just a local mess. And we're going to read FBI memos with letters specifically from the city of Atlanta, Mayor Jackson, saying exactly that. 
that he doesn't understand why the FBI can't involve. Is it because of black kids? You know, is this Carter administration is heartless to black kids being murdered? You know, if there were a bunch of white kids being killed, they, the administration wouldn't think twice about sicking the FBI on them. And I, I think, again, you know, we got that Oglesby guy, who corrupt cop. There's other corrupt cops. Wayne Williams, obviously, and Homer Williams are obviously friends with cops. So I think it comes around. You know, you got all these tips coming in, you know. You know, what's going to be really weird is, is to go back and look when I get to Atlanta and look at these tips and see how many fucking tips they had that actually talked about someone like Wayne Williams, like James Comento's car, Wayne Williams' car, all these things, and they never followed up on it. That's just total incompetence. Um, but the FBI, you know, as soon as they got involved, February, so you got March, April, May. Was it January? Okay, we'll give them three to four months. So the Atlanta Police Department had been working on over a year and a half. Couldn't do shit. Okay. Again, you got to wonder about that. Is Wayne Williams blackmailing members of the Atlanta Police Department? Is he sending some of these kids out for sexual favors for some members of the police department? I don't know. You know, obviously, you got a guy right there in Buckhead, Oglesby, who was the Buckhead area supervisor, right there at that substation, right around the corner from the studio. That's where Oglesby's office was, okay? Right around the corner from where the kids are. Right down the street from where my mom's working. Wayne Williams is doing all this right under the nose of the police. And people are looking the other way and not seeing things. Like I said, Wayne Williams could drive by with a dead body in his trunk. Get stopped at a roadblock or whatever. And say, oh, hey, Wayne, what's going on? I don't know. What's what's the latest on the, any news on the child murder? Oh, we don't know. They saw some guy with bushy hair uh, driving a white station wagon. Hey, you drive a white station wagon. Hey, don't that beat all. Oh, wow. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, yeah, that's funny. Hey, you could be the killer. Oh, ha, 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 ha. get out of here. Come on. You know, you know me. Oh, well. All right, Wayne, we'll see you later. All right. Break a leg. Okay, see you later. Bye-bye. Drives off with Nathaniel Keeter's body in the back of his station wagon. You know? Something strange. Something weird's going on there. And even today, I could pull... I could type in the words corrupt police officer Atlanta comma Atlanta Georgia and I would find I guarantee you matter of fact let's do it right now let me see what I find here hold on a second here we are so this one a single call led Atlanta broadcaster to police corruption Keith found clear evidence of corruption in July he broadcast the first of his findings on air a Roswell woman was arrested and jailed after officers. And then you got that, you know, of course, Dorsey, who killed his rival, then tried to kill the news guy reporting on it. Okay. Then you got this cop in Clayton County, the sheriff there. Corrupt Atlanta police officers leak audio. This is June 5th, 2023, on the Rashad Ritchie morning show. Shocking audio alleging three Atlanta police officers admitting law enforcement illegally targeted people. Officers busted in police corruption case. This is May 30th, 2021. Wow, it's worse than I thought. Uh, I mean, it just... 
how many of these damn former Atlanta police officers, this is the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, sentenced to prison, 2013. It goes on and on. Ten Metro police officers face corruption charges, 2013, in Atlanta. I mean, my God, folks, how much is this shit do we have to read to realize there's a problem? Here's 1995. Nothing erodes public confidence like corrupt police officers. Nine law enforcement officers sentenced for protecting protection racket, August 6, 2014, 10 years ago. There you go, folks. 2010, Atlanta. I mean, are there? <laughs> I hate to say it, but are there any police officers in Atlanta that aren't corrupt now? Or did they somehow get them all? You know? And, you know, that story about the rotten apple, you throw that rotten apple in the barrel, it's going to spoil the whole bunch. You could have a good, clean barrel of clean, washed, disease-free, bug-free apples, but if you put a rotten apple in that barrel, it's going to corrupt all of them. So... This is what Mayor Jackson was dealing with, okay? So he had to bring in the FBI. But, I mean, we got problems in Portland, where I live, but I've never seen anything like Atlanta. And But Atlanta's just like any other city, you know? But Portland and Eugene and Seattle and Tacoma and those places up in the northwest there, Honolulu, got the lowest crime rates in the country. They have a lot of community policing. I'm not saying they're perfect. You know, they just they just sent what one guy to prison in Los Angeles or not in Honolulu or something like that, right? And we definitely have our corrupt police, you know. Um, but, you know, Atlanta, I don't know. It takes the cake. And it didn't seem that bad when I was there, but I'm sure it was just as bad. I was just a teenager and wasn't paying attention. You know, you don't get to be the murder capital of the country in 1980. That's where we were, 79, 80. That's where we were. Um for no reason you know but you know Atlanta's no different than any other city in the US alright we'll keep going this is Jim Procopio but he goes by popcorn Give it a fresh look. he worked for the FBI alongside Mike McComas during the time of the Atlanta child murders Mike actually introduced me to him You'd probably be interested in talking to Procopio yeah, Popcorn's a good guy. Now, if you can get into his treasure trove, he's got boxes of stuff. Popcorn dealt with all the records and files in the FBI. And just like Mike McComas, he stressed the importance of a composite sketch they received early on in their investigation from a kid who told police that a man had tried to abduct him. Well, it was a black male with bushy hair. I remember the composite sketch very well. After interviewing the kid, they were able to form a detailed sketch of the suspect, a black male with bushy hair. After only a few minutes with popcorn, you get the impression that this guy doesn't forget a thing. And it goes back to another um, cultural, social... The thing, though, about that sketch, if it's the sketch that I've seen, and there were several sketches, I've seen photos of the headquarters, task force headquarters, they had probably ten different sketches up on the wall. But the one that I saw didn't look like Wayne Williams at all. He had bushy hair, but it wasn't Wayne Williams, you know. And I don't know if this is the one they're talking about. You'll hear um, McComas say that he drew glasses on the sketch and it looked just like Wayne Williams. Well, the one I saw didn't look like Wayne Williams at all. And another thing, if that's how they got the sketch, then that goes against the the M.O., the modus operandi, 
Remember we just went over how he got him in the car. Wayne Williams wasn't, and all these kids that got killed, never just drove up to someone randomly and pulled them off the street. Okay? Now there are a few stories, but most of the kids that he killed, he already knew them. Their fibers on their clothes at their house. In the dirty clothes. People had seen them with Wayne Williams before. They know that the kids went to an audition. Or they know that the kids were going to go see some guy about getting in the music business. So Wayne Williams wasn't just, you know, and you're going to hear another guy say that Wayne Williams pulled up to him, you know, up near Fulton County Stadium and whipped his car around. He asked him if he had wanted a ride and almost pulled up on the curb, you know, like that, he says. But the majority, matter of fact, all the kids that got killed weren't just some random pull off the street. Okay? All right, so we'll go. Keep going here. Economic issue. When Maynard Jackson became mayor, first black mayor in Atlanta, the first thing he said was, I want to make the police department more brown. Police department up at that time had some black officers, several who were majors and above, but it was mainly a white police department. Well, when the white officers heard that, they saw they saw the handwriting on the wall. If you were white, you're not going to rise rapidly in this department. It's going to be black. A lot of the older ones, they said, we'll see you. They retired. So consequently, they lost many of their senior officers, the best homicide investigator. Then they had a big cheating scandal. And the police department, they found out that a lot of the black recruits in the police academy were given the answers to tests. So that was another major scandal. So the, the police department was left in 78, 79, 80, relatively new and inexperienced. So I guess some of the homicide detectives were not that experienced, and they missed the signs that th there were. You know, and you hear this, I, I don't know about what you hear in the black community or the Hispanic community or the conservative or the liberal community or whatever. But when I grew up, that was like the burning topic that would just set off most southern white older males that I knew. It was affirmative action. It just drove them crazy. Reverse discrimination. I can't get this job because they got you know, only one position for a white guy, and they got over 100 guys, white guys applying. They got three positions for black guys, and they got only like four. So it's discrimination against white people, you know. But I'm for affirmative action, okay? If you have a high school that is 60% black, you're not going to want your teachers to be population to be 75 percent white they're just not going to relate okay it's just stupid stupid and same thing with the police force you know you don't want in a city like atlanta it's 60 percent 70 percent black you don't want a 70 percent white police force because what that what happens is the white officers are perceived as an oppressive occupying force and they don't relate to the people in the black community because they don't live there they go do their job they beat up a few people they make a few arrests they maybe shoot somebody and then they go back and they live in Kennesaw white suburban Kennesaw, Roswell, whatever and they develop an attitude that oh it's back into they're hunting they're not serving, they're hunting okay whereas a black officer is more likely to know the people that he's dealing with okay Hey, Jimmy, I know you. What are you doing hanging around with these bunch of losers? I'm going to tell your dad next time I see him. 
They're going to church with them. They live around the corner. In Portland, and almost every, I think most of the police communities in, um, in Oregon, if you're an officer in Beaverton or Portland or Gresham, you have to live in Beaverton, Portland, or Cresham. They used to have that. I don't know if they have that anymore. But I think that's a great idea. You have to live in the community you serve. Okay? You, you, you have more at stake if you live there. Okay? Hey, you can't be doing this here because this is my home. My kids go to school here. I live here. Okay? Whereas, fuck, I don't care, a bunch of goddamn maniacs and drug addicts and losers. I'm going to shoot a few, beat up a few, and they go home to my safe little comfy home apartment in the suburbs, right? So, when you're involved in the community and living in that community, much more likely to give a damn, okay? And... It's the same thing in Israel. The reason why no one will ever defeat Israel and no one will ever defeat the Jews and people just don't understand this is that we have no place else to go. Between the terrorists trying to kill us and rape our women and chop the heads off our babies and burn people and murder people between them and my family is me with a gun or a tank or an F-16 we got no place else to go this is our home so we're going to fight for it so you can't lose the Arabs can send wave after wave after wave this is why six, seven million Jews can take on what? 300, 400, half a billion fucking Arabs and never lose. Is because our back is at the sea. Our back is at our, our got our children and our grandmas behind us, okay? So we're, ne- we're not going to lay down our guns. We're not going to go your way. We're not going to get tired. We're going to fight and fight and fight until someday, somehow, some way, you guys get it in your fucking heads. You're never going to kill us. You're never going to destroy us. The easiest way to have peace, you know, the easiest way to have peace in the Middle East is not for Israel to give up land. It's for Arabs to get it in their fucking head that they're never going to defeat us and to just go live in peace and stop trying to kill us and stop sending their children to kill us. Anyway, I didn't mean to get on my soapbox here, but that's the difference. When you live in a community, you give a damn about what happens there. That's why affirmative action works. Okay? It's not just a job. You go and punch a card, you know, like the sheepdog and the coyote or the whatever that cartoon is and then you go home anyway keep going commonalities in the 8 to 10 to 12 they had by the time the bureau got in they were up to 14 10 found 4 missing further the FBI does not investigate murders murder is not a federal crime if it's committed on a government reservation it is if a certain federal authority is it is if it's, it's killed in the commission of a civil rights violation it is but we don't investigate bureau doesn't investigate murders like you have on the street every day so we had no jurisdiction we went to the Atlanta Police Department and says here we're here to help you and you know we were greeted by yeah right we want all your files so I went through all the cases we assigned you two agents or one agent per victim and we had 14 of the victims at the time so we said go out and redo the case look through it give it a fresh look come back and tell us what you find <laughs> about 10 of the 12 of them come back and said these look like local crimes we were pretty much convinced that it were, they were all local homicides that the APD had bungled we didn't see any pattern. We didn't see anything. The FBI, along with local police, 
were not convinced they were dealing with a serial killer. But as the death toll of black children was growing, they began to recognize similarities in the murders. It would start with a child going missing for days, weeks, and sometimes even months. And the FBI became involved in many of the searches. Popcorn recalled the first big search he was a part of. There were a thousand searches all over the city. One place was Red Wine Road in South Fulton County. If you go there today, it's right off 285. There's a huge shopping center with a Target and a whole bunch of stores. Back then, it was Woods. About three o'clock, the team down on Red Wine Road says, we found skeletal remains. So everybody hauled ass, and it was like being in Vietnam again. There were the news choppers overhead. They got wind of where we were. All the news choppers were overhead. So I got there there about five o'clock. And I'm walking, and I park my car in Red Wine Road, and I walk in the woods, and something catches my eye at 11 o'clock, and I walk over, and there was a skull and more human remains. So we had two human remains within 100 feet of one another. So you remember that was uh, Lee Terrell. They found out there. They were actually were looking with dogs for Luby Getter. I don't know why they decided that's where it was at, but there was also... Six months before, I believe, another body found just around the corner there. And then they found Lee Terrell, and then, what did they find? Was it Mathis? I have to go look at the list here. That they found also. And so, there were some things that, like, the fibers that weren't on one of the bodies. But because of the location, with another victim that did have fibers that match that's how they were able to link that other victim there and this led to one of the most bizarre episodes about a hundred feet below both bodies we found a playboy magazine it was that week's playboy magazine it came out that Wednesday, this was Friday. So we found the Playboy magazine and it was a sticky substance between the pages. I'll let you decide what that was. So he immediately fantasized, the investigators. The killer came back, came down here to the site of the murders, masturbated, then took off. This is key evidence. We packaged it up, raced it out to the airport, gave it to the captain of a Delta jet heading for Washington, D.C. An agent picked it up as soon as the plane landed, rushed to the FBI laboratory. They gave it to a lab, they developed prints and identified the sticky substance. We didn't have any of the prints on file. So they sent it to the APD to look up through their files. Within an hour, they identified the print. So we went in, we arrested the guy, we searched his house. We uh, brought him to the bureau, we polygraphed him. He passed the polygraph. What the hell were you doing down there? He says, well, my wife just had a baby. I went down there that afternoon. Now, do Every suspect, the Saunders, this guy, uh, Uncle Tom Terrell, um, the pornographers down near Lakewood, they checked fingerprints. They pulled fibers. They searched all the the houses and everything like that. And nothing ever matched up until they got to Wayne Williams' house. During that time, we were part of the vice president, George Bush's task force. Everything I wrote went to a unit chief at the bureau, went to the director, to the attorney general, to George Bush. George Bush read it. So the one thing he asked us was, please don't tell my wife. We said, you goddamn idiot. Do you know the vice president of the United States knows what you did when you went into the woods and you're worried your wife's going to find out? By the way, we codenamed that. It was known as the Woodwhacker. So a lot of people make a big deal about that, about uh, George Bush being involved. And he was just, all he was doing because the vice president has nothing to do, okay? So when something comes up that's not your typical department that's already there to handle it, they'll assign the vice president something to do. I mean, he, he does have kind of a job. He's the, the moderator, whatever you want to call him, in the Senate. And he casts the, 
the tie vote or whatever, you know, the tie-breaking vote and stuff like that. But the rest of the time, he doesn't have anything to do. He's just being briefed, just like the president. He's like a president in training, a president in waiting. Okay? So they gave him this job, just like Biden. When Biden was vice president, guess who they gave the job of, you know, running around with all the money, checking out the money for um, the bank bank recoveries and the economic recovery. They signed that to George, or excuse me, to, uh, to Biden. Because Biden's been on all these fucking committees. He knew everything. He'd been around for 30, 40 fucking years. So he knew how things work. He's on appropriations committees, banking committees. He knew all, you know, he knew all these things. He had all the experience in doing that. That's why I laugh when I, they, they talk about, you know, Biden's senile and doesn't know anything and shit like that. I mean, shit. Biden's probably forgot more than 10 Trumps combined. He's probably lost more brain cells and forgotten more than Trump could ever, ever, ever imagine. You know, Biden's been on the Foreign Services Committee. He's been a big supporter of Israel for 30, 40 fucking years. Appropriations Committee, the Military Committee, Intelligence Committee. He was on the Judicial Committee with the... You know, when they had Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill. He's seen it all. He's been briefed with all of it, you know. And then also he was the guy that handled the money for Ukraine. You know, they Obama used the money as a whip. Reform, get your corrupt oligarchs out of there. We're not going to give you any money. And that's what this whole that Republicans tried to make it into, you know, some kind of scandal with Burisma, but it was really Obama saying, look, we're not going to give you any goddamn money if you keep having these corrupt oligarchs. Anyway. But Bush didn't have anything to do. And Reagan wanted to keep track of what was going on, but he couldn't take the time every day to, to read everything. So they had Bush read it for him. And if something came up that they wanted, they needed to comment about, he would bring it to the president. You know, a lot of people didn't know that George Bush and um, Ronald Reagan had either breakfast or lunch every, every day together. And they would just informally talk about shit, okay? And something explosive like this, you know could affect everything and so that's why George Bush is reading it all right popcorn's first big lead went nowhere popcorn had found the bodies of 11 year old Christopher Richardson and 11 year old Earl Terrell Christopher had been missing for eight months and Earl had been missing for six months Uh, to me on the surface these cases seemed open and shut A Playboy magazine with semen on it was found near the bodies, with the suspect's fingerprints on it. But after an extensive interrogation, the suspect passed a polygraph test. See, that doesn't make any fucking sense. You got two bodies that you obviously have... You can do sexually whatever you want with them, but you go and get a Playboy magazine, and you masturbate in the Playboy magazine. But you've got two children, you could have done whatever you wanted to with them. So... It's obvious to me that the Playboy, and there was a gallery magazine there also, and shotgun chills, weren't related. If you see this dead end, there's a lot of people dumping shit. You know, um, grass clippings, furniture, trash, tires, dead bodies, Playboy magazines, stuff like that. That's what people do at these intersections. These dead ends, they, they drop shit. And a lot of these places you see where these bodies are dropped are places just like this, okay? You can pull up, back the car up, pull the body out, drag it in the woods a, few, a little bit, 
run back to the car, close the door, take off. Best. And despite all the bizarre circumstances, the FBI was convinced that this man was not involved in the murders. So they moved on. Both Popcorn and Mike McComas told me that when the FBI got involved in these cases, there was an extreme tension brewing in the city of Atlanta. Of course, the blacks wanted it to be somebody white, and the whites wanted it to be somebody black. And I can't speak for the rest of the Bureau, but my partner and I, Larry Ellington, we talked about it a lot. First off, our profilers said that um, serial killers rarely cross races. They'll kill in their own race. And all these kids were black. Popcorn and McComas both mentioned FBI profilers, the people who formulate an idea of who the killer is, who the FBI should be looking for. And there was one characteristic that stood out to me immediately. It had to be a black guy. A white man could not go into a black neighborhood, pick up a kid, put him in his car, and drive off without anybody seeing him. If there's a crime scene, then the media was just unbelievable. And with all of the attention this case was getting, it was almost impossible to get into a predominantly black neighborhood and not be challenged or approached or whatever if you were white. It just doesn't happen. In fact, when we went into black neighborhoods during the investigation, everybody on the street... And people, a lot of people, he's gonna, you're going to hear him challenge that, but I think it's absolutely correct. I mean, look at the Karen, the Karen videos we have today, okay? There was one Karen video that had a black babysitter with two white children in the back seat. And a concerned citizen, Karen, said, this isn't normal. And so she called the cops. The cops came. They pulled their guns on the guy immediately. Oh, it's a young black male. has got to be, got to be, got to watch out, you know. Come to find out, he's the babysitter. He's taking him to get a burger or something like that. You got black mills showing up at uh, parking garages, you know, or outside of condominiums, and Karens won't let him in. Uh, uh, oh, what apartment, what condo are you in, and what's your name, and how long have you been here, and... Um, no, I'm not going to tell you any of that. It's none of your fucking business, you psycho Karen bitch. You know? All because they're black males. Okay? We, we've all seen the videos. We all know it goes on. And how many times have we seen black males get shot by the police because they reach for their cell phone or were holding a cell phone or whatever in the darkness? It's called racial fear, folks. And the same thing can happen in the black community. Again, if you had a bunch of black guys running around my neighborhood, stopping and, you know, if I was walking home and black kids, you know, black guys in cars are driving by and stopping and, hey, kids, you know, uh, I'm looking for this address and, all this kind of stuff. Well, we'd have nosy neighbors, they'd be calling the cops on them. Okay? These black guys are in this neighborhood, this mostly white neighborhood, and they, we usually don't have guys like this in this neighborhood, and we want to know what they're up to. Well, it's the same thing in the black community. You're not going to have a, a van load of white guys running around, pulling up to a group of kids going, Hey, you want to make some money? You want some candy? You want an ice cream? After all this shit that's going on, there's, they're going to run like hell and say, hey, these white guys in a van pulled up and offered us money and, you know, s tried to give us some candy and stuff like that. But do we hear those fucking stories? Now, I did, went over, did go over a news story about a white guy that was offering candy to black kids, but very, very rarely. I mean, we would hear about this. It would be in the news. We'd be one of those news stories that I've been playing you in the archives there. There'd be a news story about a white guy pulling up to black kids, offering them money, offering them rides, shit like that. Okay? And with all the black kids already know, they're already thinking, that's eh, probably the Klan. Don't get any rides from strangers and especially white guys. Okay? So, 
that ain't happening. Anyway. The street was out on their front porch as soon as we appeared in the neighborhood. There was one place that I think is gone now. It was a housing project. They had what they call the Bat Patrol. And these were adults that walked around with baseball bats and looking for suspicious characters or protecting the community, whatever they call them, the Bat Patrol. We were over in this housing area. We had two young um, uh, black kids uh, that had supposedly seen something we thought. So Larry and I were tasked to go over and pick up these two children and their mother. So here we are in this, uh, the brown Ford again, and Larry's driving, I'm in the passenger side. And they're probably talking about Eddie Duncan, because Eddie Duncan was right over there. Um, Matter of fact, I was just looking at that address for Eddie Duncan. Let's see, hold on one second. And it's interesting because Eddie Duncan was last seen right here. Yeah, is this Mills? Yeah, this is Techwood. Eddie Duncan was last seen, like, right here. And what I find interesting is that one of... Actually, no, it was right here. He was last seen on the corner right here. And what I find interesting is that right here and right here were two offices and they're st- they were still running because they're being run by Jimmy Jen and Patricia Evans of Michael Thevis of his GRC record label right there and they had an entertainment label right there eventually the IRS comes and you know grabs these offices and sells off all the equipment and stuff like that in it but at that time Eddie Duncan was last seen right here that was the last place he was seen, a block away. I found that interesting. I was like, no fucking way. Another one I found that's interesting is that, you know, you got the FBI, which is right, yeah, right there. Yeah. There's the FBI, and right up the street, like four blocks, three blocks, four blocks, is the Roxy where Wayne Williams and Nathaniel Cater is seen holding hands. So literally within minutes walk from the FBI is that. And then also I'm finding in this area here is where uh, Michael Thevis' office was Original lawyer's offices were right in here, in this area, and of course his office, um, hold on one second, yeah, his office was right there, and the studio was up on Simpson, where my mom used to work, right there, and, yeah, Simpson, yeah, Simpson right there. And it's literally like two blocks from the other offices right there. All right, anyway, keep going. And we have the mother sitting in the middle and the two black kids in the back seat near the windows. And two young boys, and I, don't, I think they were like 10 or something, 8, 10, 12, I don't know, somewhere around there. And we didn't get two blocks before we were boxed in by about four, three or four different police cars. And we weren't proned out that it was coming to that before we finally got them to look at our identification. Hey, we're FBI agents. See, what's happening is the news playing and it's got any information, contact the police, the FBI, whatever. People are calling the number. They're sending out, well, can you come into the office? Well, I don't have any transportation. So, I mean, it's really not that far. If you go Techwood, there's the FBI office right there. Boom. Straight up, boom, five minutes and you're in, you're in Techwood. Another thing about Techwood is that if you just go, there's Techwood right there. There is 
North Avenue, okay. The San Suchi Lounge is right there. Or excuse me, the San Suchi Lounge is there. Fox Theater's there. Alfred Evans was last seen right there. Wayne Williams was hanging out at the San Suchi Lounge. There's Cypress Avenue, okay. Built more hotels right there where I was at. And then uh, here's Spring Street. Adamans right there. And then, what was that? The, the Cornet? Not the Cornet, but some. Anyway, Nathaniel Kidder was hanging out in some club here. So it's all the same fucking area, okay? Right there. All right. Yeah, Fifth and Cypress, that's where Handcuff Man kidnapped that policeman. <laughs> right there. Okay, we'll keep going. Because somebody called in. There's two white guys with uh, some black kids in the car. So it was tough getting in and out of certain areas. And so we were kind of convinced this guy had to be black. He had to be black. We just couldn't figure out how he was getting him in the car. Was this a skewed opinion coming from only white males? Was it that impossible for a white person to walk around the inner city of Atlanta in the early 80s? I don't know. I asked Eric and Jasper Cameron. They grew up in Atlanta during that time. If anything, they would know. First, I felt like it had to be somebody that could move around in, in, in the community. So therefore, I felt like it had to probably be somebody black or somebody who wouldn't draw suspicion. Because, you know, over there where we live, a white person walking around over there, they are going to be, you know, it's going to draw attention because right. that wasn't happening then. Now, now you go over there, it's, it's like, you know, everybody. But back then, nah. Now, even you know, today. It, 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 it would have drew too much attention. So I, Say, I mean, I look like a cop. I don't mean to look like a cop, but it's just my hair is really thick, so I keep it really short because it gets really hot here. And it's like a carpet on my head if I have it, you know, if I let it grow out. I let it grow out in Portland because it would be cooler, but here it's, you know, 20 degrees fucking hotter. But, uh, yeah, and I wear, like, these mirrored sunglasses, and if you see me walking down the street, you're going to say, that's a fucking FBI agent fucking cop. I don't mean to dress like that. It's just cooler for me, you know, because I'm old and get dehydrated. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, everybody thinks I'm a cop. I remember one time I was in Eugene. Uh, Oregon, and I went to this laundromat, and I'm sitting there, you know, washing my clothes, and they got the homeless people there, a couple of druggies and stuff. They're hanging out in front of this laundromat, and I'm sitting there kind of close to the window waiting for my clothes to dry, and this lady, she pounds on the window, some homeless lady, and she goes, <clears throat> she looks at me in the window, and she goes, are you a cop? And I said, if I was a cop, would I tell you? Probably not. And I said, well, there you go. So you are a cop. And I said, you never know. You know. But would it, And then I looked at her and I said, would a cop be washing his clothes in a public laundry like this? Probably not. Oh, there you go. But yeah, everybody thinks I'm a cop. I mean, I... I've literally turned corners, walk down streets and turn corners, and kids hanging out will get up and see me and, like, get up and immediately start moving the opposite direction. And I'm just walking down the street. I, I guess also because of the way I walk and handle myself, you know, I've got this don't fuck with me, Clint Eastwood type kind of walk and move about me and the way I talk when I'm on the street and shit like that so you know it's all about projection you know people if you project a certain image either intentionally or unintentionally people are going to believe that you know all right we'll keep going I always felt like probably with somebody who could move around pretty easy you know undetected without really causing a lot of suspicion but not everyone agreed on that this is Bernard Parks. He grew up in Atlanta, too, and was also a child at the time of the murders. There are certain guys that, you know, that they were around. I mean, you know, it was like, there weren't a lot of white guys, right? But, but there were some. 
Yeah, I mean, like you grew up, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, one or two white guys that went to my school, right? But that's just because their family didn't have no money, right? So they were just around, and so you kind of accepted them. But, you know, I always say, you know, they got cousins, they got friends, they got people that hung around that we accepted. It wouldn't have been normal, though, for in that time for a black guy just to walk up and be accepting of a white guy without somebody understanding what's happening, right? I mean, it's just, it, that just wasn't normal. I mean, you just question, period, because you're in my community and this ain't your community. Yep. I asked Monica Pearson, the former news anchor in Atlanta. Her memory was crystal clear. They weren't looking for a murderer. They were... So I remember I was in Houston, and there's this area of Houston, like southeast, kind of a rough area. And again, it's all projection. I project myself as being a tough, badass you know, don't fuck with me. You know, I even raise my shoulders and puff my chest out a little bit. You know, and so I'm looking for these machines, these water machines, you know. And um, I walk into this, I thought was a mechanic, auto mechanic shop. And it was a chop shop. They were cutting cars, BMWs and Mercedes, taking off. You know, they were, it was a chop shop. But they had the water cooler there. And I walked in, and I knew immediately I walked into a bunch of gang members in a chop shop. All of a sudden, all eyes were on me, and I'm like, so then what you do in a situation like that is you don't act like a badass. You act ignorant and um, non-threatening. So then I kind of changed my mode, and I go... Uh, yeah, hey, I'm from uh, Texas Premium Water, and uh, we're we're trying to pick up our water cooler. Oh, yeah, there it is, right there. Yeah, um, yeah, you were at, he had it at the other office there. Did you want to keep the water cooler? Because I can change the billing to this address. And this guy, the manager or whatever, comes over. Oh, no, 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 you, you, you can take it. You can get out. You just go ahead and take it. I'm like, oh, okay, well, thanks a lot, you know. And go over there and grab the water cooler and, you know, get out, and then my heart stops pounding, like, through my chest and shit like that. And when I try to be non-threatening, I always, I love Richard Pryor, and I always try to do his impression of white people. It's so funny, you know, hey, well, hi, Milton, hi, Milton, what's going on there? I guess what's going down the road here, you know, and I'm, oh, gee, lordy, you know, like that, and that's the funniest thing to me, I always thought. I, I love, I grew up on Richard Pryor, Red Fox, Bill Cosby, you know, unfortunately. Um, but, eh, oh, I got to tell you something about Bill Cosby. I I always remember this episode that he did back in the 70s because we used to listen to his albums. We'd listen to Red Fox, Robin Williams, Richard Pryor, and uh, Bill Cosby. That was like our go-to comedians right there. And sometimes... Um, that other guy, I can't remember his name, the white guy. But, um, so I always remember this, that Bill Cosby, back in the 70s, was talking about the Spanish fly and how he, he had read that the Spanish fly was some kind of tablet that you could put in a woman's drink and it would drive her crazy and make her wild and she would want you. And, and so all he thought of when he was a teenager was getting a Spanish fly. Ooh, Spanish fly, Spanish fly. Ooh, going to get lucky. Yeah, you know. You just put it in the drink. You'd see these advertisements. You put it in the woman's drink, and she'd drink it, and all of a sudden she's all over you, and she's taking off her clothes and all this kind of stuff. And we thought it was funny, you know, at the time. But then it's weird how things change your perspective depending on what's happened, right? You know, oh, run, OJ, run, OJ, you know it, that's cool, but then when he's running from possibly murdering his wife, then that's it changes the whole perspective of that, right? But with Bill Cosby, the Spanish fly thing, now, now that we know what we know, all these victims, they, he was drugging them and then raping them, changes the whole perspective. Now it's not funny. It's like shocking going, oh, God, I used to laugh about that. That's, ugh. God, I'm nauseous now. I'm sick, you know. But, again, I think people, psychologically, they project out what's in their mind. 
whatever going on in their mind, if you listen hard enough, you'll hear them confessing or telling the truth. People will tell you the truth of how they really feel if you listen enough. Okay? And if you listen in a certain perspective, that people will always, they'll end up telling you everything. Just like with Wayne Williams. I'm sure he's told somebody, somewhere, the truth. You know? But, anyway. I, I made this suggestion a couple of months back that the governor should offer Wayne Williams a deal. Okay? We're going to let you out of prison on parole. Ankle bracelet. Meeting the probation officer every month, every week or whatever. Um, supervised housing for a couple of years. All the whole thing. Drug testing, all this kind of stuff. But... Or, you know, maybe in the beginning, offer, offer him like a club fed type thing. And then if by the time he's 65, he can get out on probation. You know, kind of a tennis courts and a private room and, you know, TV, microwave, good, better food, shit like that. But you got to come, you, you got to come to Jesus. You got to tell us everything. Okay. You got to tell us what really happened, what you know. But of course, you know Wayne Williams is going to lie his ass off. He's going to put it on somebody else because he didn't want to admit that he did that. But that's what I would do. I'd call his bluff. Here's your way of getting out. You're going to die in prison. Matter of fact, we're probably going to, if you don't come to Jesus, we're going to come after you on these other, other murders here. And you may get the death penalty. But that's what I would do. If I was the governor, I'd make him a deal. We all want to know what happened, Wayne. Come to Jesus. This is your moment. Tell us what's, what really happened. What you know. What you did. You know, like the FBI profiler. You know, did you really enjoy it when you were strangling those kids next? Come to Jesus, Wayne. Cleanse your soul. Cleanse your, your mind. Tell us all what happened. Let these children rest in peace. Let their families rest in peace and finally have the answers. Yeah, I was molested as a kid. I did, never got help. I blamed the community. And I killed these kids to get back at them. That simple. Come to Jesus, Wayne. Tell us what really happened. We'll let you out. You can spend the your senior silver 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 years, whatever, you know, in Florida. You probably have to go in the witness protection program because some, some of these families will probably try to kill you which is why you're not telling anyone <laughs> why you're not talking but if I was the governor I'd, I'd have them make a deal that's what I would do alright that's enough for now alright take care